All right. Hello. Good morning, Amanda and Jesse. Morning. I I won't be able to say much immediately for a bit. Okay. I'll be able to say a little bit later on. All right. But I'm here. That sounds good. How are you? Well, I'm doing okay. Uh, getting ready for our meeting here. Um, So, um, yeah, last week we had a pretty good meeting. Uh, I know that, okay, there's the notion if you want to follow along. I know that Morgan had a lot to say last week, and we were talking about some of the things from the Slack and, you know, some things that he had, very good insights. Um, I don't know how we're coming with the, uh, the presentations that Amanda and Jesse are going to be doing soon. But I think Amanda wanted to do a 10 minute block today. So we can do that. Uh, we can also talk a little bit more about what those papers or presentations are going to look like if we don't know by now, because you know, it's coming up. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Okay, that's fine. Well, you can go over what you have. I mean, it's not, you don't need to do a full presentation or anything. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I guess Jesse can't be with us right this minute. And Amanda, uh, well, first of all, I'll ask if there are any updates, if people want to give updates now or later. I um, don't have too much of an update. Um, our cognition features meeting this week was really good. Um, yeah, I did say that I would have more prepared for today, but I do not. No, that's fine. Um, I just lost track of my obligations that I had this past week. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to go over the notes that I have, um, and to talk about a couple, like, not obstacles, but just like, yeah, areas where I could use feedback. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, would you like to do that now or? Sure. Okay. Um, let me, I have to, I'll need like five minutes. All right. That's good. All right. Uh, well, let's say Jesse says that uh, lots of project admin work going on behind the scenes. Yeah. So that's good. Uh, Anything you'd like to add to that, Jesse? Or... Um, yeah, I had an interesting insight that I'm, I'm working into to one project. Um, I'd like to incorporate uh, a kind of specific to, to be to be kind of light and, and very high level, um, essentially an intentional auto ethnographic component to part of the new structure that I'm working on. It could transfer into some things that are already happening in terms of um, condition futures, but it's inspired from. Um, An old, an old leadership program that I was a part of that sort of unbeknownst to me modeled a lot of really important things about this and, and other topics. Um, sort of um, as you're growing and learning across these sort of new disciplinary spaces, how do you like, process that as a practitioner of it? Um, that's part of it. And at a, at, a, at a different and higher level or separate level, um, just the structuring of some things. It's not really an interesting topic to get into, but it's it's sort of been a, a major thing for me to to sort out even personally as I'm pushing some things forward, but also just like um, you know structuring different like sort of groups and subgroups and, and all these things. And how do you refer to that? It's really, it's really not 
not really fun. Um, but we're ready to just everything. Um, and and uh, suffice to say, you know, progress comes there, but it comes a bit slowly. But but it's it's I continue to be really excited about it. Oh, um, so things are coming on that thing. Well, that's good. Yeah, I was looking at your uh, or at the big uh, uh, big unfinished ideas Discord and how you rearranged a lot of it. So it looks like looks fine to me. I mean, uh, you know, I don't really have any suggestions for reorganize. You know, I mean, I think it's fine. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, I guess that's somewhat related, but some of the, I tried to be able to get a couple of threads there, and I'm not sure whether I really like them or not. I'm for some some more topical things. I would really love. I I I debate a bit like having a specific area just to drop links, because it's like you can. You can drop links about the project, but it can be the same as advancing the project, you know, or, or like project updates. You know, we've had that debate for a long time, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just, um, yeah, in some ways it's it sort of, the, uh, Project, project, project management costs of, of like caring about that often is just not really. Um, there's not so much effort to go into to that that level of things, anyways. So it's sort of like, you know, so it doesn't really matter. Um, but yeah, and I'm realizing like some things. A part of the structure work is like, even even at that level, like what what do we want to be in in or as lap or in that server in general versus not. And what's, you know, how, how do I structure things relative to Oral and Joe Pro and, and like commission features and stuff like that. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so again, sort of much, not, not a lot of concrete things to say. But yeah, I don't know if Amanda's ready to talk about those things, but I could go on, but I think I might have some more later on. Today in general. Okay, yeah, we can we can come back to it later if you want. Uh, that, that's good. Uh, thank you, Jesse, for that update. Um, yeah, was, again, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're experimenting with it and looking at what needs to be done. And uh, I haven't had a lot of time to do that sort of work this fall, or even like in the past year, probably. I've been going over a lot of this stuff for like a year, you know, kind of a year in review. Uh, I know we did the blog post the nine month in review, but I, I've had to do the Devo Worm annual review presentation, for example, uh, and that's up on the YouTube channel. And I, you know, kind of going through that, and uh, yeah, it's just like kind of <laughs> you keep you go through there and you say, well, we did a lot, but like you know, I wish we were better. Do we have better organization, or you know, there's things you wish that you could have done in the year and. So that's good. I think that's good to have that, to revisit that every once in a while and uh, think that through. Yeah. So Amanda, how are you? I'm good. I'm ready to share. Okay. Right. Um, let me see if I can share my screen. Okay. So this is where I've been putting all of my disorganized thoughts as well as the organized abstract that I actually submitted um, and where I feel like I've made the most progress, which is not the, the paper draft empty, um, but I have a good outline. Um, so <clears throat> I, we talked about this before. I like the framing of this as like an instantiation of neurophenomenology. Like we describe what this project is and then we say like, now we're going to basically do it. Um, we're going to start with certain like first personal findings um, and then we're going to see what they would imply about how to better study the mind scientifically. Um, so those first personal findings, um, that, that's how I want to frame like some basic 4E style 
commitments. Um, so I, I want to frame this as a kind of instantiation of neurophenomenology, um, which, so first I'll like describe what that is. Um, I want to explain why the mind-body problem, like that, and we've seen other authors talk about this, why setting up that dualism from the start um, like just leads you to to failure at solving it. Um, like you you bake in these dualist assumptions and then you basically like create the problem. Um, but another way of framing the problem that philosophers of mind often talk about is the explanatory gap. Um, like the gap between the first personal and the third personal. And I like that framing better because it implies that it could be narrowed. Um, so I think I want to frame this as like, an, yeah, narrowing the explanatory gap. That's like what Varela's project was about. You don't have to start with this hard dualism to acknowledge that there are like, there's distance between our scientific study of the mind and our uh, like first personal experience. Um, so that's what we're doing. Um, I was really intrigued by what Voros talked about in that paper we read about how the body itself is this mixed or dual object. Um, I think another way to say that is that like our experience of being a, a living being um, is itself like a solution to the mind body problem or like it shows that that problem doesn't exist with the force that philosophers often ascribe to it. Um, like we, we are like living examples of like the, the bridge between mind and body. Um, and I think that would be a good starting point to get into why um, like interoception um, and a focus on the, like on the body would be fruitful here. Um, I'll come back to the notion of control what's highlighted in blue, because that's one of the, maybe like, I'm, I'm trying to figure out where to fit that puzzle piece in, because uh, it definitely feels very important. Okay, so the, yeah, I want to frame certain like 4E hypotheses um, or commitments as findings from like a basic first personal reflection. Um, and the one that I, I need at various points here, I need to like pick which one to focus on and explain it well. Um, so I think the one I want to focus on is one that Fuchs talks about a lot, which is this coextension of the lived body and the living body. Like there's overlap between the objective body and our subjective body, usually. Um, counter examples would be like a phantom limb syndrome. Um, where your like experience, you experience maybe a, a limb that has been amputated. So there's that subjective aspect of, um, like you, you subjectively feel that your body extends, you know, through your leg that you lost, but uh, the objective body doesn't exist there anymore. Um, so maybe pointing to some, some times where that coextension uh, comes apart to demonstrate what is usually there, which is. Um, the, the spatial extension of our subjective experience aligns with, you know, the boundaries of our bodies. Um, so that's what I want to say suggests like interoception as a kind of, as a first personal method. Um, I think the microphenomenology paper is important to bring in here, not just because the reviewer mentioned it, but, um, I also think it was a good, I don't know, I don't want to like, the, I feel like the alternative would be digging into Husserl and these like older, more original texts, and I don't want to do that. So yeah. um, I think I'm just going to go with the microphenomenology paper. Um, I liked that one of the points of that paper was that you have to come into the first personal practice with as few like predetermined categories as possible. Um, I think that aligns with what other phenomenologists talked about with having to bracket your judgments and your expectations. Um, 
But one question I had after we went into that paper was like, well, you have to start somewhere. Um, you have to, uh, it's like, it, it just seems impossible to have um, a completely blank slate when you're trying to like, whether it's interoception or another kind of first personal reflection, it kind of, it, it doesn't make sense to talk about coming in with like a completely blank slate. Um, and I think I can explain that better with references to the microphenomenology paper. Um, but if the categories have to come from somewhere, then uh, why not look to physiology? Um, why not like bring in the, the, the third personal aspect here? Um, so certain categories that we've, like certain dynamics that we've uncovered pretty successfully from like third person um, physiology or biology. Um, here is where I have to find some specific examples. Um, maybe those are good candidates for um, like starting places of how to uh, like delineate different dimensions of variation in our first personal experience. Um, and then this is where like neurophenomenology as a dialogue is essential um, because once you start with some of these maybe physiologically informed uh, categories, um, then you can get like feedback on them from your first personal practice and you know you can go down this cycle. Um, but if you have to start from somewhere, then like our uh, commitments to embodiment suggest that like well looking to third personally observable bodily dynamics could could be a good starting point. Um, I'm not quite sure how to bring in this, we can't feel our neurons line, <laughs> um, but I found that really compelling. Um, like I want my reaction to that, to be a part of this, um, project because like there's a sense in which that's absolutely right. Um, but also we certainly feel the results of our, of like variations and, you know, neuron dynamics. That's, that, that seems obviously true. Yeah. Um, but then it's also obviously true that we could, we can't like zoom in and feel an individual neurons like action potential. Um, but as we've talked about before, like that doesn't need to be the case for us to be able to uh, use a first personal practice to explore um, things that ultimately come down to, you know, to brain cells. Um, and here, I think one thing that a strong embodiment thesis would suggest is that the like neural dynamics at like the cellular level, things that are important there um, for our mental experience um, are probably things that exist in like full body, body-wide dynamics. Um, like if we zoom out, if we stop trying to like conceptualize neurons as encoding or as being computational. And we just look at like the more basic physiological like metabolic level, um, which we can also, that's also a lens we can take to maybe any cell in the body. Um, then that could be illuminating. And this is where that um, cognition is entangled with metabolism paper could help me out um, because uh, my thought is that even if you want to describe brain activity as importantly computational, um, it seems like the more basic physiological dynamics, they would have to be the backdrop to that. Um, so variations in those more basic dynamics that are maybe more easily measurable and don't require so much, um, you know, like computational neuroscience and these complicated measures and interpretations. Not that it would be uh, easy, but things that are a bit more like, um, just like more basic biology instead of uh, brain specific. Um, th those kinds of dynamics could be a place to look for, um, for important aspects of our mental activity. Um, here I think is where uh, Fuchs's discussion of affectivity could be helpful. Um, like this basal affectivity 
uh, being like the background to all further cognition. Um, yeah, I still need to connect some dots there, but I feel like Fuchs's discussion of affectivity is, would be like the first personal categories. He talks about like uh, mood, um, emotional episodes, these different manifestations of affectivity, in addition to like this basic, basic background feeling, um, like the feeling of being alive. I feel like those are the those are the first personal categories that seem like they would align with the third personal categories that would probably be based in like cellular metabolism or something. Um, again, like body wide, full organism stuff, not just brain stuff, um, but things that could be like the background to potentially more complicated or more like computational brain activity. Um, so I don't want to argue that like, the, the, I don't really want to touch the whether or not computation is happening question, um, but this would matter like whether or not the answer to that is that like, you, you, like even if the brain is computational in an important way, it seems like this stuff would be the backdrop to that and would be things that would like alter the parameters or something, for lack of a better word. Um, and yeah, then I thought of a few objections that have come up in various forms in our conversations. Um, the first kind of category is that, um, and this I guess is specific to like first personal investigation. I'm not sure to say this. Um, Uh, here is where um, we've talked about like a, a first personal reflective practice. If you come in with assumptions and you know categories, then your findings, um, your like first personal data will be laden with those those categories and theories. Um, one first kind of response to that is. Uh, like the first personal practice is a skill. So, you know, with practice, you, you get better at not bringing in your expectations. Um, I guess that would be number two there. The first response. Um, yeah, so part of Varela's like dialogue and mutually informed constraints is that you get feedback like on the, on the theories with which your perception is, is laden. Um, so your, even if, uh, like your first personal reflection involves categories that you can't fully bracket, um, part of the process is like getting feedback on those categories. Like if, if your first personal practice then is like flawed in certain ways, you can, um, you just, and this is what Voros was getting at. You just have to like do it. <laughs> you have to, um, engage in the practice and get feedback that way instead of just theorizing about it. Um, and then the last possible response to that is maybe where I want to bring in this idea of like control being central. Um, and so like if you if the first personal reflection is inherently theory laden, um, Yeah, I'm not totally sure how to connect this yet. Um, but if you, this is where I need example, examples. Um, if you're engaging in a first personal practice and you have a certain like conceptual um, like glossary of terms with which you're trying to like categorize your various aspects of your first personal experience, um, the, those terms can be like more or less accurate. You can have a, a better or worse uh, kind of conceptual framework going into it. Um, and then in the process of applying those concepts to your experience, that's where like first you can get feedback on those concepts. Um, second, maybe you can develop the skill of like re refining those concepts before you even engage in the practice. Like that could be the, the bracketing try to minimize the, the number of expectations beforehand. 
Um, but also, <clears throat> if those concepts and categories do affect your first personal experience, um, I'm trying to frame that as like a, a virtue of this. Like that's that's not an objection, um, but that's something that like can contribute to an informed kind of dialogue between your your conceptual library and your like first personal experience. Um, and then the last kind of objection I had in mind is that basically there are some things that can never be the object of first personal experience. Um, in Fuchs's language, they're like always transparent. You're always experiencing through them instead of experiencing them as objects. Um, and that gets to the, we can't feel our neurons line. Um, like there is a sense in which we're always going to be experiencing through the brain <laughs> instead of like experiencing the brain as, as such. Um, but I guess that just, that doesn't feel like a good objection, <laughs> objection to me. Um, again, with practice, you can, uh, make things more and less transparent or, uh, maybe when, maybe there's something at a particular time that's like not going to be able to be the object of your attention, but then at a different time in a different context, you can change that. Um, I'm sure there will be boundaries to this. Um, like there, you will never be able to feel, <laughs> to feel an individual neuron spike, but is that, I don't think that's an issue for the, the project. Um, all right, that, I guess that's it. Those are, those are my thoughts. I'm wondering where exactly, where and how to bring in control. Um, and by control here, I guess to be a little more clear, I mean, um, that when you have a particular uh, like set of categories going into a, a first personal um, practice, I guess the shortest version is like there's a mind over matter that happens. Um, there's like you you can alter your maybe in this case it would be better to talk about like since we're talking about the the body explicitly is like you can alter your physiological dynamics by paying attention to them. That's like a central part of meditation and you can, and like anger management, even like you can lower your heart rate by, by paying attention to it and then by reacting to that. Um, and I can see why that could be framed as an objection to this, like how good a first personal data specific to the body can you get if just by starting to pay attention, you can alter that. But I wanna frame that as a, a virtue. Like when you have control over the thing, um, that's a way that you can learn more about the, the dynamics of the thing. Um, yeah, so that's great. Yeah, thank you for that overview. I think you've got some really good parts here. And, you know, it'll, it'll, I think the presentation will come out of this. So it'll be fairly easy to put slides together and then finish the paper because you really have a pretty good outline. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about control, but I wanted to give pe other people opportunities to ask questions or comments. My next step is finding quotes from these references um, that are helpful. I think that's what I'm going to really have on the slides. Yeah. Yeah, Jesse says looks good so far. So that's yeah, that's good. Uh yeah, so I guess control wise, I guess I mean I don't know what the citations would be, but I think basically that model that you described where you say feedback, like you start with a conceptual world and you know that we talked about last week about development and language, how a lot of people view even when they don't say the word development, that language is sort of a developmental milestone in terms of concepts. So if you have like, you know, categories to put things in, it makes things easier. Uh, now that doesn't, you know, when you talk about like, uh, like autonomic processes or physiological processes that you can 
monitor and, and, and you know, you, you still can't communicate a, a state. Like I can't say I feel weird or inside or, you know, whatever states that people come up with linguistically. But, you know, you still can sort of discern those states nonetheless. Like if a baby's hungry, they cry. Of course, they don't have words for what that state is yet. But, you know, uh, people often don't have words for emotional states that are sort of what you described as background uh, states. Or even sometimes emotional states are complex enough that they don't really have words for them. So there are a lot of ways that, you know, you can think about that in terms of, you know, you have language that gives you categories. The categories sort of cast over those things going on at the physiological level. And there's this feedback between the physiological scale, what's going on there, generates things that you have to describe the internal state somehow. So, you know, whether you're trying to describe it to a doctor or in a, in a novel or, you know, whatever, it, you have to have the language there to do it. And some, you know, sometimes you don't, haven't acquired the language for it. Sometimes you don't, your language doesn't have a word for it. Sometimes you just, uh, you know, it's hard to describe, period. It's too complex to really describe in like a word, you know. So th those are things that, you know, it might be kind of uh, ways to think about that. Uh, and then, you know, there are also skills. So you gain, you acquire skills in different areas and you say, okay, this is a skill that, you know, maybe I have a better coping mechanism than I did uh, two or three years ago. Uh, you know, what does that look like in terms of me regulating things? So, you know, there, there are different types of feedback like that. Uh, there, yeah, there's a lot of literature like in, in uh, social psychology and things like that that might be relevant. Uh, you know, they, people do stuff with like self-efficacy theory and other types of behavioral theories where they're basically talking about feedback. I know there's the big five cybernetic personality theory, which is explicitly like talking about feedback. So there, there are different places like that you can look maybe for some things to put references to. It looks like Morgan wanted to say something. Well, um, yeah, uh, sorry, I was, got a late start this morning, so I've also been breakfasting. But, um, uh, you, you know, one, that was, that was great. And, you know, covering a bunch of really difficult topics, especially defining words. <laughs> um, uh, <clears throat> And then just thinking recently about, um, you know, language translation and the difficulties or how, how some languages are better at expressing some things than others and, and how that um, kind of reminds me of, of mathematics incompleteness. And that that you know, it's it, you build up this structure on certain basic building blocks, and you know, and it can be good at describing this this area, but not so good here. And you know, but you use different building blocks, and you get you can do that area better. You know, um, <clears throat> and you know how that must, or at least when we start to. Um, reflect on our internal states how how I, I certainly feel that m my language is inappropriate or like is incomplete and and um, um, uh, uh, yeah anyway, it, it's it's tough it's difficult <laughs> yeah. I, I I wasn't sure what the big five cybernetic is that related to the big five personality types yeah so it's like a version of that uh, um... Hussein worked on that for his oh. GSOC project. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah, it's coming back now. Yeah, so there are a couple of citations, I think, from like 2015, 2015 era, <coughs> where they worked out a lot of the details. <clears throat> so you had, you know, basically you have these personality types, and, you know, you get feedback, you have interactions between people, and, you know, people can be repulsed or attracted by, based on this compatibility of states and things like that. Um, I don't know, like, there's probably a lot more to it. There's, like, uh, you know, different aspects of 
uh, personality itself. But, uh, you know, it, yeah, the, otherwise, I don't know if people have explicitly asked, like, a philosophical question with, like, a cybernetic kind of approach or, you know, focusing on feedback. So that might be something, too. It's interesting to kind of say this is maybe a future direction for the work, but I can kind of establish some outlines of what that might look like. Right, because the goal is one way of framing um, like part of the goal of neurophenomenology is like developing the language for your your internal states um, and doing so while getting the right kind of feedback from both your internal experience and whatever like third personal scientific categories you're you're trying to use. Um, so it's like, what's what's the best way to go through that process of like a, applying the language and then seeing how well it fits? Um, when do you, you know, modify your concepts? Um, and then so so this project would be is focusing on um, like bodily affect um, and like physiology as the as the categories, as opposed to like some of other some of Varela's other work, which is on like time consciousness. And then on the third personal side, he's exploring like more uh, computational neuroscience kinds of, I think he uses EEG, um, but he's not focusing on like body-wide dynamics, okay. like zooms in on the brain for that. Um, so there are different like versions of um, the different ways that neurophenomenology could be instantiated. But I think one thing that's would be common to all of it is like, the question of how you develop the the language and the categories and how you do that while there's just like a, a yeah a feedback that has to happen like as as you're engaging in the process you have to be like receptive to I don't know if error messages um when you're like like trying on d d different languages for this stuff yeah <laughs> Just suddenly made me think about um, <clears throat> like trying to do uh, psychophysics, but of of this, you know, like like trying to find some some introspective uh, um, some introspective phenomena that that y you can say is simple and and um, um, you know, I mean, I. I, I assume this is why, you know, gurus focus on breath or, you know, like your Yeah, your like what are the most or, basic what are the most basic parts of our internal experience and how do those correspond to because like our like embodiment, um, like the the for e cognition one oh one, like those those uh hypotheses would say that like, well it's it'll be whole body dynamics that are relevant here. So it's like, yeah, looking for the dimensions of variation in your mental experience and how those correspond to variation in, in physiology. And, and, you know, um, Musk has a lot to, to answer for in various domains, but, you know, being, being cut off from Twitter, it, it's like I, I miss, um, you know, like somebody who was very active on Twitter, and that's why I'm missing this person is Micah Allen. Um, yeah. Do you know in, in our house? Um, um, and he's the like, um, it's like the e ECU, I, th I think is it embodied cognition unit, I, I, I think. Or okay. ECG. No, it's an obvious, obvious, sorry. It's, obvious, obvious, sorry, right? it's ECG, right? It's <laughs> embodied cognition group. Um, uh, um, and um, he is like trying to do a lot of these these things. I, I think to to some yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Jason. Um, anyway, I, I miss his um, I miss his his you know constant commentary on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> about it about his own life, about politics, about uh, you know Danish healthcare system. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I really miss that community. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Anyway, but he he also like I think tries to do 
I mean, he's trying to do that in a much more physiological way, not necessarily phenomenological. But but I but I think he I, I think he would be really interesting to look at again, or you know, see, see you know, because he he'd gotten started several years ago, and it was only now that that probably some of that work is actually coming out. Um, and again, I, I would know if I was like on Twitter. <laughs> Yeah, Jesse mentioned in the comments here about Avery's work on allostatic kinds. I, I don't know if you're hooked into that. I so it's that's been mentioned dozens of times in different contexts. So I feel like I have a, a good impression of what that is. Um, and that seems to, I guess this is a different conversation. But when Boros in the paper we read was talking about how a goal of neurophenomenology is to explore this like non-dual space, this like conceptual space that exists uh, aside from first personal experience, but outside of uh, third personal scientific measures, but somehow like describes both um, that allostatic kinds seems to fit into that space. Like it's that level of abstraction and generality um, that's still trying to describe, you know, both, both of these things at, at once. Yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Uh, Which is, see, yeah, C cybernetics is doing in a lot of cases too. It's like the right level of abstraction where it could potentially describe, um, like it can obviously describe a lot about a, an organism, like a physiological system, but like how, but potentially it could describe uh, like first personal stuff, like maybe aspects of cybernetics can uh, provide like good. A good conceptual, you know, library for uh, first personal practice. Yeah. So Jesse says Avery is doing a lot of other work around some typologies, or basically spectrum spectra of individual experience in a more nuanced way. More about this some other time. Yeah. So thank you, Amanda, for that uh, presentation and, and you know giving us some. Things to think about in that area. I, I, yeah, yeah think... sorry, it was messier than I wanted it to be. But yeah. I guess, like, yeah, like I said, I think the slides, because it's a philosophy conference, um, which normally that you don't even have slides, you would just be standing in front of a room. But I feel like for virtual, you got to have something. Yeah. Um, I think I'm going to find quotes that help explain the things I was fumbling over. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for the feedback. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, definitely. You know, we've been we've kind of moved from uh, human use of human beings to like a cybernetics discussion group on Thursdays. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, it'd be nice to kind of work some of that out in there. Uh, but we can also work it on the cognition futures mm -hmm. group. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, that's that's, you know, we'll be working on that. I don't know. You know, you'll have the paper, I guess, for the conference, but then we can work beyond that, too. I mean, it's fine. <laughs> Probably there's yeah, definitely. A... As I'm working on this, I definitely see it as like one one sliver of this bigger project. Um, this what we've been calling the the methods project. I guess this yeah. is like there are a lot of different routes that we could go down with this. Yeah, I think in the methods project we have the paper pyramid, and we have the methods, but it's kind of like we have open spots in the methods, so. <laughs> So we need to fill those up. And I think, yeah, we can definitely work out some more formal methods for this or at least kind of see where that might go. And uh, yeah. So thank you again, Amanda. Um, so Vershali's here. Hello, Vershali. I don't know if you are prepared to say anything. Yeah, hi. So anything new or you just uh, want to join in on the conversation? I mean, <clears throat> you don't have to. Nothing much to tell you, but uh, from this week, uh, I will start continuing the project, like working on the project. Okay. So, over, so I'm more free to start working with this. Yeah, well, that's great. We'll come back. <laughs> No nice to see you again. Uh, yeah, we should meet more on that. Um, uh, yeah, I've been working on some things as well. 
uh, in the realm of XR and how we might implement it in the lab more broadly. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll have to talk about that. Maybe uh, we'll pick up the open source meetings again because those were pretty useful. I just haven't done it because I've been, you know, we've all been busy kind of uh, at the end of GSOC. But. So yeah, we'll, we'll stay tuned on that. Okay. Um, did Morgan, did you want to give an update or? Well, it was, uh, I, I, I kind of did at the, um, cognition futures, but, uh, sure. Uh, the, um, it was a nice meeting with, uh, cog lab, um, which is a Paris, Paris based, uh, uh, student run, um, the cognitive science group. And they were, uh, uh <clears throat> an early precursor to Meritech X. So um, one of the reasons why there's there's uh, the, the French are so well represented in Meritech X is uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, is because Coglab was was a part of their their founding, and um, plus plus some French Canadians too. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, but um, uh, that was that was that was really nice to reconnect, and obviously again, let me just to uh, uh, pitch the. Um, uh, Meritech X Global Hackathon happening December second and third, um, which is a is a cool event to um, <clears throat> you know even just uh, participate in um, uh, the 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 mayhem. Um, there's there's a, a a lot of students that kind of have to be there, <laughs> and so it's a part of their um, uh, this Ecole uh, Forty Two. Um, uh, is a strange um, computer science software engineering school where they throw people into these projects and then they give them 42 hours to work where they wake up at 7.42 or I, I, I don't know, 42 is mixed in there. Um, uh, you know, I, I shouldn't say anything. My, my Twitter thing is a, is a um, is a Douglas Adams quote too. Yeah, yeah. But um, uh, uh, it, um, uh, it, they're they're great though. I mean, it's a great it's a set of students. They they all produce something in these two days that are that are really interesting and and um, it's uh, great to watch them all working at it. Uh, anybody who's interested in participating, you more more than welcome to. Um, and uh, yeah, and again, last year you know was really amazing that. Uh, <clears throat> to do a data challenge with the Job Mine Institute data set, um, which is this large normative data set of thousands of kids in the New York, uh, New York City area, and it is continuing to grow, um, where they've got fMRI, MRI, EEG, um, neuropsych, everything. And uh, they did a data challenge on predicting your biological age from your EEG and a very short recording of EEG too. So this is only only a minute worth of data resting. So no task <clears throat> and and yet still incredibly predictive. Um, so it was interesting to cover that. Um, that work has still not been written up, which is is um, a travesty. Um, and uh, so I need to follow up with um, with some people at Job Mine Institute and see um, see if somebody is already doing. I mean, somebody should already be doing this. But yeah. <clears throat> uh, that was so that was great. And um, they are keeping the data challenge this year under wraps to make it um, more uh, well, so that people can't get a head start on it. Uh, I don't know if that was a problem last year, uh, yeah. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, you know, I, I was involved in picking the data set. I was not involved in doing the the challenge or the you know the competition part. Right. So um, uh, that was it. Was also great to meet people from. Um, so met a PhD student from the Dream Team, which is a, um, a Paris Brain Institute, which used to be um, Brain and Spine. They've renamed it to just Brain Institute. Um, uh, has a Dream Team that's focused on. Very much consciousness studies, like uh, uh, the group that uh, Amanda's with uh, the Center for Consciousness Studies, 
um, <clears throat> looking at levels of consciousness, you know, uh, uh, but definitely more of a sleep focus than say an anesthesia uh, surgical focus in this case. Um, uh, but it uh, actually reminded me the um, there was a uh, there's a group in DC uh, PSW. Anyway, it's sort of one of the oldest scientific foundations in the United States. I'll, I'll find a link to it. But um, last night's last night's talk was on coma states, which again is <clears throat> is a, a related um, and the, um, the the Giga group. I think I mentioned that when Amanda and I talked. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's a, is it related to Carnegie? I, I, I'm not sure, but anyway, it's very interesting because they they start each talk with like, this is the 2478th meeting of <laughs> you know, <Yeah>. the, <laughs> the PSW, <clears throat> which I kind of I, I kind of like that. You know, I mean, if the Royal Society did that, it would be such a large number, right? Yeah, um, I see. I see now upcoming events. Well, this was yesterday's meeting number yeah, yeah. 2485. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> and um, it, it was, um, I, I believe the guy's background, I only caught some of it because it, it was kind of also time kind of during dinner. But um, uh, he's, so one, it's 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 a cool lecture series to follow. I mean, they have great speakers. Uh, in this case, it was an anesthesiologist. <laughs> and, and in particular, talking about the issues of brain death. <clears throat> but but brain death because it well it, it's very much related and um, and coma states and whether you are in an irreversible coma state <clears throat> was was really the question about brain death right and uh, this is somewhat related to um, Adrian Owens uh, into the gray zone or into the gray. Uh, it, it, so it's looking at people who um, are in coma states, but perhaps are locked in, right? That they are fully conscious, but <clears throat> um, but they're unable to, absolutely unable to move their body and and respond in any way. And again, it relates to this: are they are they brain dead, <clears throat> or are they locked in? And um, so. Uh, Again, like uh, Dream Team, um, he seems to be he's, he's a new new student. So when I pressed him on, like, so what's the team working on? <laughs> like, I, I I forgot my second project right now. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but it is is very interested to uh, learn more about. Uh, we had some people joining us from um, Iowa that are doing hyperscanning with large groups of meditators. <clears throat> And so, you know, talking about uh, Guillaume Dumas' uh, high pipe, it's like H Y P Y P uh, toolbox for for looking at this kind of hyperscanning. He, he, he this uh, Nicolas Ducat, um He wasn't familiar with Guillaume's work at um, the Institut Pasteur, where he scans a same woman like a hundred nights in a row. She was keeping dream journal. Um, and yeah, you know, those kinds of case studies can be interesting to collect that much data, but, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I don't know, uh, how much they could get. I would still want to do, you know, flashing lights while she's asleep, you know, kind of thing to, to really, yeah. Anyway, uh, psychophysics all the time. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and, um, and then uh, Emmanuel Garon um, joined us, and um, which was nice because um, he is an old alumni from La Paez, which uh, you guys might not know, but was a, a wonderful uh, hacker space, maker space, biohacking space in Paris, central Paris, in a really weird spot. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but a beautiful 18th century building partially funded by the government um uh it, it, like the outside was was let's just say a lot of criminal activity but but uh, but inside um <clears throat> i don't know why it was situated there 
but a really wonderful spot that um, that uh, yeah existed for a number of years, but um, eventually was shut down. Uh, and he was really interested in whole brain emulation. So of the you know uh, anyway, he, he he seems to be of the Brian Two story or Roman Brett's paper. Um, uh, that's the developer Brian Two, <clears throat> but you know, interested in spiking neural networks, um, and in particular, you know, is there a good community of people, open science community, focused on on the, that kind of research? Um, so we talked a little bit about open neuromorphic, uh, and their their community, as well as um, uh, some other things in terms of like neuroimaging and the virtual brain project and things like that. Uh, and he put me onto a conversation that he's going to have soon with carboncopies.org, which seems to be um, another another interesting group <clears throat> that um, I, w I wasn't familiar with, but um, uh, I'd like to like to learn more. You know, it seems more of a neuroscience-driven group than say Numenta, which is you know Jeff Hawkins' group, yeah. which is more of like a tech-driven neuroscience effort right. uh, and both both really great <clears throat> uh, uh, for everybody that is interested um, Numenta does their lab meetings online too right and uh, they're, they're they're super hardcore mathematical ones <clears throat> um, you know, very very um, computational neuroscience focused uh, and um, I'm, I'm trying to remember their kind of CTO's name. Um, I'm blanking out right now, but um, anyway, carbon copies. Um, uh, come, uh, let's see, K O A E N E seems to be the uh, PI there or lead lead there. So, hoping to learn more about that. Um, and yeah, they they'll be starting up every week. So that's Wednesday mornings now. <clears throat> uh, Wednesday morning specific time. Yeah. Uh, evenings, Wednesday evenings, Paris time, and yeah, pick your time zone in between or after. Uh, so, uh, the uh, and the sorry, the computational neuroscience, oh, sorry, computational psychiatry meeting at the Phil on Friday, <clears throat> um, yesterday was great. Uh, so this is a woman who's at the Crick. Um, and those are familiar Crick's uh, uh, an incredible, um, it's like a molecular biology focused uh, research center right in the cent center of London. Um, and it's got uh, incredible resources there. It kind of, I mean, it's like a, kind of reminds me of like a Janelia farm, but like, but bigger. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and more, more, general cellular biology focused right than, than um, and uh, but she runs the psychosis group there or the psych the, the calls it the psychosis collective and um, and was, the focus of the talk as I put in the, the slack was um, looking at uh, uh, psychosis cross species right so so I, I was like okay <laughs> what, what does that mean? And um, and for, again, for those not familiar, you know, animal models of mental illness have been notoriously bad, you know. And I don't know why Jitsi is putting a thumbs up there for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it started putting one. I don't know if it passed on to others, but um, uh, so depression is um, what is it? Uh, having a mouse by the tail and like how long do you give until you give up struggling or something something like you know right. I mean, i'm just giving you like the sorry Amanda. Oh, like learn the learned helplessness studies yeah 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 i, I mean this this you know um i mean i'm picking on a particularly bad one but uh but but it gets it gets harder of course when you start to talk about symptoms that seem more um human or more um language based or you know like subjective uh, certainly and uh that was that was her real focus was was 
how can this, this is work that she did when she was at Cold Spring Harbor? Get, could she find, you know, could they develop a better, a better animal model? And, um, and it, it's a very predictive coding based, um, you know, which I don't, which, you know, is good, good and bad, or, you know, and, uh, uh, and I, I certainly think that she had very, very interesting results from that. And, you know, and I, and, and like, because of the way it works, like, I, I, I think, you know, computational psychiatry is definitely the right, um, the right label for this work. Um, cause it, it was, it, it's cha changes in those kinds of, uh, predictive models and, you know, um, relating to neurotransmitter agonists and things like that. So that, that was really interesting and, and, um, I'm going to check if they've got them online, though, because I see, uh, I mean, anybody can join the Zoom, and anybody who's interested, I, I can send the link, but um, uh, I don't know what's going on with um, with their YouTube, and uh, so I'll po post a link as soon as I see one, um, but she also had a really interesting case study where um, a brother was given stem cells from his diagnosed schizophrenic brother and started displaying symptoms started yeah started displaying positive symptoms um uh and i, I you know so I, I don't know what to do with that i you know that's the kind of thing where it's like obviously you don't want to do that to people in the sense right. of start start giving them uh injections of other people's cells uh, just to see what happens um but uh, she, it, like I said in the, the notes, it's, it was a lot more immunological uh, discussion than, than I expected. And, you know, which again, I thought was interesting and, and uh, you know, um, appropriate and like lot, lots to learn there. Yeah, I saw that in the Slack. <clears throat> so you're talking about yeah. things in the Slack, to be clear. Yeah. So yeah, that's great stuff. Yeah, thank you for that background on on the things that your your update. <laughs> uh, yeah, definite computational psychiatry. I'm glad that you're you know kind of fleshing that out in terms of what you mean by that because you know I think you can throw around a term, but like what does that mean? So I think you, yeah, thank you well, for that. Yeah, for a lot of people, it was definitely like taking these, you know, reinforcement learning models and showing differences in kind of their, their behavioral task. And um, uh, sh sh that, that work uh, was much more biological and, and you know, the kind, of, the kind of work that I think we've been talking about in terms of making it, making computational psychiatry more computational biology. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, so thanks for the updates. So uh, now I'd like to move on to some things that <coughs> now I'd like to move on to some things that I have for like features, uh, some discussions that have happened the last couple days or new papers that have come out. So, uh, so the first thing is I wanted to point out that last week we had a figure called the brain is a blank and it was this, uh, this figure here. So this was the one that um, we talked about where they had the literature search and they said the brain is, and then there were a bunch of terms that were physiological or uh, dynamical systems related or networks or information processor. So they, they had all these, uh, you know, they, they kind of they did a UMAP analysis of the space and they came up with this answer. And I said, this would be interesting to follow up on. Uh, so, Morgan, I, I said I would get the reference. Morgan also uh, identified the reference. And I remember reading this and then getting the figure, putting it in the materials from last week and then forgetting about the paper itself. So this is the paper actually where it came from. Uh, the brain is dot, 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 a survey of the brain's many definitions. This is a bioarchive paper. It was posted on Halloween, and it's Taylor Bolt and uh, Lucina Uden. So she's at uh, UCLA. 
and uh, Taylor Volt is at UCLA as well. So this is uh, basically the paper alongside this. Uh, so this is talking about the peer-reviewed neuroscience literature. Uh, you'll often find terms like the brain is a dynamic system or the brain is a computer or a complex network or highly metabolic organ. If we go beyond cognitive science, you'll find people talking about the brain in different ways as well. We don't, we haven't talked about that as much. So, you know, if you go to the neuroscience literature, people have their pet system or their pet topic that they want to talk about. And they kind of make that analogy to some analytical technique or some sort of, you know, uh, thing that they're interested in. Now, you know, if you're doing, if you're studying metabolism, you say, okay, the brain is a metabolic organ. I'm going to show how this, you know, how metabolism works in the brain. But of course, the brain is doing something. It's producing behavior. And, but you don't focus on the behavioral aspect of that. So part of it is metaphor, you know, the choice of metaphor. And the other part is what your focus, what your study focuses on. And so sometimes you can lose uh, the forest through the trees on that and just kind of focus on one thing. And then if you did a literature search of how people are thinking about the brain, you would find that, yeah, there are these compartments that people sit in. They do these studies, wonderful studies sometimes, but they don't, you know, they, they don't get any farther beyond that topic. So in this paper, we sought to survey the most common phrases of the form, the brain is dot, 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 in the biomedical literature. Uh, they used text analytic tools to, to do this, and then they identified over a dozen frequently appearing phrases. And so the most used phrases include metaphors, the brain is an information processor or prediction machine. So that's another thing too, like a lot of the predictive processing stuff really is based on this uh, metaphor of being a prediction machine. So, you know, that's, there's been a lot of, uh, there have been a lot of publications devoted to saying the brain, brain predicts X or the brain does some prediction of something because obviously the brain is doing something goal oriented. But, you know, well, I mean, you could argue that it isn't, but, uh, you know, we, we want to sort of understand the goal oriented aspects of the brain. So we say it's a prediction machine, uh, ignoring what the brain does sort of, you know, otherwise. So the brain isn't always doing prediction, uh, but that's what we, the metaphor we use. And it's an it's a, uh, artifact of our interests, you know. So if we're interested in the predictive aspects or the goal-oriented aspects of something, of course we'll say it's a prediction machine. And then that's kind of constrains us in, in some ways. Or sometimes people use a description of essential functions. So a central organ of stress adaptation. Or sometimes they talk about the properties, which is a highly vascularized organ. So, you know, this is like not, I mean, this is descriptive. It's not like telling us about function necessarily, although it is at the physiological level. Um, you know, or it could tell us about structure maybe. Um, but, you know, this, these are the kinds of things. So, you know, a lot of times in neuroscience, and, you know, there's this longstanding criticism in neuroscience that there's no theory in neuroscience that really theory is needed, and then people proceed to do a lot of empirical work and ignore that. But the I think the idea that theory is needed, this is one of the consequences of it, is that since there are very few really good overarching theories in neuroscience, you know, you have localized theories, but you don't have overarching theories, at least in the way we do it in theory, built like formal theories. Um, we have hypotheses, we don't have theories necessarily. And this is the result of this, where you have these compartments of thought where you say, well, we'll use metaphors, we'll use essential functions that describe the brain, whatever we're interested in at the time. If we're interested in cognition, well, it's information processing or it's you know physiological function. But bridging those parts is very hard and it doesn't exist in the literature that much. So you don't see that. And I'd be interested to know, well, I kind of know the answer, but I'd be interested to know if there are, like, how many papers are that actually bridge these kind of concepts. Um, so, yeah. Uh, 
So yeah, this is nice paper. Um, so that was, you know, something I wanted to follow up on, make sure people knew where that came from, and we gave the authors credit on that. And uh, we actually, you know, can think more about that as we go along. Um, so another thing that happened yesterday, and it was like all over the place, this discussion. Uh, so Sam Altman, of course, was the, the face of OpenAI, and he, you know, was ousted yesterday by their board. So they had a, a board meeting and they said, you know, we're parting ways with Sam Altman. And, and, you know, this is, of course, OpenAI has been doing a lot of work on large language models. And, um, you know, they've been partnering with Microsoft and all of a sudden he's gone. So I don't know. Uh, you know, this is something I think that was there was a conversation in the Slack yesterday. It was Morgan and, and Hussein were talking about it. So they, you know, it was kind of very controversial. It was all over social media and people were wildly speculating as to why. So, and it was pretty sudden. So they didn't really like preface it with anything other than like we've parted ways. Uh, do you want to say well, something? I think it's good to, to give a shout out to, to Hoodline for, for um, being the first, first out of the gate with the news. Um, that's a, a local San Francisco blog. Oh, okay. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, it, <clears throat> I think the, the controversy around it is is really just how he, he literally just did dev days. Oh, yeah. It, you yeah. know, and so, the, the, like, he was just, you know, the, the, the first time that he's kind of on stage representing, representing them at a developer conference, their first, supposedly his first developer conference. They've done plenty of events before that, but, <clears throat> um, and, and like, like no one seeing why, or, you know, like there's no history of, you know, like open AI is going, going downhill or something like yeah. that. Like, <laughs> it's, because it's, because it's so, um, uh, because they're doing so well right. and, and there doesn't seem to be any controversy. Uh, that's why I think it's been such big news, um, which is, which is my comments on the, the, I think that, that everybody sees that there's just a very, very large pile of money sitting there. And um, that that you know, I don't know what's going on with the board and I don't know if, if any of us ever will. Yeah. <laughs> But but I think it has a lot to do with this very large pile of money. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I mean, whenever there's money involved, it starts to get pretty contentious. And it, it, it is uh, it is good to point out that it is it's very much a part. Or you know, um, the CEO of Microsoft got on stage with him during the event, and uh, and that kind of speaks to you know again, like I don't know what's going on there. But like it, it is very rapidly become a, a kind of subsidiary of Microsoft. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, well, that might be too. I yeah. wonder how much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like how much this has to do with Microsoft's own directions and goals. Yeah. So I, I actually I tried to pick because there was so much stuff coming out, noise and otherwise about it. I tried to pick some things here. So uh, let's see. Uh, here it is. Uh, so I have it labeled as open AI drama. So, so this is uh, this discussion right after the announcement was made, and it was like, there's this why is Sam why was Sam Altman fired? And there's like the announcement was I guess at like 4 p.m. Eastern, and this kind of goes through. They don't have these colors labeled, but basically the point of this graph is that there were all sorts of things that people were talking about in terms of like you know what why he was fired all sorts of reasons and then you know there's like a, a i guess this is like a like a betting market where you have like a probability or something you know and then some of these spiked to almost 100 percent, or maybe it was part of the uh, proportion of the conversation and the point is is that there were a lot of competing this uh you know explanations as to why, and they were just all over the place. Uh, so yeah, that was, it was pretty, I've never seen like a, something trend like that. I've never seen this kind of graph. 
where you have like all these different things. Maybe this is something we could use to explain like the brain is a blank and show like over years, like what is the dominant explanation, you know? Uh, but that's, it's, it's quite, you know, in meme land, I think this is quite interesting. Uh, Jeremy Howard had a Twitter uh, thread on this. Uh, and he was, of course, had a take on this. Uh, so I just kind of grabbed the screenshots here and we'll go through what he had to say. So Jeremy Howard said, okay, everyone's asking me for my take on the open AI stuff. So here it is. I have a strong feeling about what's going on, but no internal info. So this is just me talking. Uh, first point to make it was that is that Dev Day, which we talked about just now, of Microsoft was, in my opinion, an absolute embarrassment. And by embarrassment, he means like uh, we'll see in the next post. I could barely watch the keynote. It was just another bland corporate corp speak bunch of product updates. So that's why a lot of these events are. They're just like even the Apple ones. They kind of announce their products. They go through a demo, and everyone I thinks that they're like star studded, but they're really just like they just walk through a demo of something, you know. So it's yeah, you know, that's what you get. But I think maybe the point was is that OpenAI is sort of being subsumed under Microsoft's product umbrella. So for those researchers I know that were involved from the beginning, this must have felt nausea inducing. The plan was AGI, lifting society to a new level. We got laundry buddy. And so this was like one of the things from the keynote where they talked about all these different uh, apps that they were going to build with uh, OpenAI embedded in it. And one was Laundry Buddy, which was ask me anything about stains, settings, sorting, and everything laundry, which is, you know, practical. You know, it's an application. There are a lot of applications. But, you know, that's I guess the, the point here is there's a tension between the people who want to you know change the world or want to do like peer research and then you know people want to build applications or the applications are very limited in scope and you know that's a tension in science a lot of times you know you get people who want to do you know uh, peer science versus applied science so a lot of times people in peer science will ridicule people in applied science and vice versa uh for various reasons and, and there's always that tension so i you know, I, I get where he's coming from on this. Uh, then he goes on. So let me zoom in again. When OpenAI was founded, I felt like it was going to be a rough ride. So Jeremy Howard was involved in OpenAI at the beginning. It was created by a bunch of brilliant researchers that I knew and respected, plus some huge names from outside the field, Elon, GDB, and Sama, Sam Altman none of whom I ever came across in any AIML conference or meetup. Everything I heard about those three was that they were brilliant operators and that they did amazing work, but it felt likely to be a huge culture shock on all sides. So, you know, you have these people who are researchers, you have these people who are quote unquote operators or basically like, you know, business, uh, people with business acumen, not necessarily the technical background of, the people doing development, which is another tension, of course, in technology. Uh, you know, you have people, in, even in science, where you have people who are more promoters of work than people who actually do science. And a lot of times science popularizers or people who are heavy promoters of, work, of their work are ridiculed by scientists who aren't. It's just a, a thing that you find. Uh, I guess it's just the personality differences and then compounded by, you know, people getting attention for things maybe that they uh, aren't, didn't do, I guess. Like, you know, if you see Elon Musk do a presentation on something, you know, how much of the engineering of that did he actually do? It, you know, if he's, uh, if you're talking about Tesla or something else, or, you know, someone like uh, Sam Altman, you know, being the face of an organization and people doing the research want to go in one direction. He's taking the organization in another direction. So it's just the tension that happens in these kind of organization, organizational setups. So they are brilliant operators and they did amazing work. But it felt likely to be a huge culture shock on all sides. But the company absolutely blossomed nonetheless. So you can overcome this in times when there's, you know, 
a, a clear goal or like you're starting out. But then, you know, at some point you get like this clash of cultures. So with the release of Codex, however, we had the first culture clash that was beyond saving. Those who really believed in the safety mission were horrified that OpenAI was releasing a powerful large language model that they weren't 100% sure was safe. The company split and Anthropic was born. So Anthropic kind of came out of OpenAI and the people who wanted to go in a different direction. So Codex was, of course, the large, first large language model they released. And, you know, anytime you have a big release like that, you can have a lot of tension about how it should be used or, you know, the direction. Uh, and Google's a big funder of Anthropic. Okay, yeah. Uh, now OpenAI accelerated in its new direction. It wasn't open anymore. I think I posted in the Slack at one point. I said, OpenAI is neither open nor about AI discuss. So that was, uh, you know, definitely stopped being open in the conventional sense. Uh, and it decided to pursue profits to fund its nonprofit goals. So this is, again, you know, another thing you find with foundations and nonprofits is that you have, you know, the, like the community and the open source aspect. And then when you get money involved, you know, you, you can make a decision to be a nonprofit to do things to serve a community of, of users or a community. Uh, or you can go commercial and become proprietary. And OpenAI kind of moved in that direction. Sometimes that's out of necessity. Sometimes, you know, organizations uh, will have like a, develop like a proprietary arm and that will fund the open aspects or, you know, so there are a lot of tensions there too. As organizations grow, they get these, they go in different directions and they start to develop, you know, like different aspects of the, of the, of the organization. So this is not by no means unique to open AI. Uh, nonetheless, the company remained controlled by the nonprofit and therefore by its board. So the board actually, if you have a nonprofit, you have a board that tells you or they, they kind of their or guidance or steering uh, or, you know, a component. It's, it's sort of like oversight so that people don't just kind of uh, embezzle money or like uh, do things that are unilaterally bad for the organization, that sort of stuff. So, uh yeah, so we're all talking about like a, a an eight year time frame. So we founded the OpenAI nonprofit in late 2015, and so this was a 501c3, and then you know the 501c3 is the nonprofit, and then you eventually at some point you get to the point where you say, well, we want to kind of you know become proprietary, and so the 501c3 becomes ancillary to the commercial part, and this is where the tension comes in. But the 501c3 is controlled by the board, and so the board could make a decision like this. Suddenly, Sama, or Sam Altman, the CEO, was everywhere, giving keynotes, talking to world leaders, and raising billions of dollars. He's widely regarded as one of the most ambitious and effective operators in the world. So he's really kind of doing a lot of PR, a lot of uh, be, becoming very influential, but was that kind of filtering down to the rest of the organization and the, the goals of the people who wanted to do things research-wise or, or, you know, other things that weren't involved in promoting the technology. So this is, uh, so I wondered how his ambition could gel with the legally binding mission. So this is where, you know, you start out with the 501c3, you have a legally binding mission, you have like a, an organization, it's based on some sort of governance, uh, and then you, you're doing this. So it's kind of in conflict with that uh, mission. And so we always suspect that our project would be capital intensive, which is why we launched with the goal of 1 billion in donation commitments. Yet over the years, OpenAI's nonprofit received approximately 130.5 million in total donations, which funded the nonprofit's operations in its initial exploratory work in deep learning, safety, and alignment. So they had this, you know, I guess they needed to uh, raise a lot more money than they did. Uh, I mean, you know, you know, I don't know how much money you actually need. I guess it's a matter of like, you know, saying that if you're going to scale up and you need more computational power or talent, you need more than donations. And so you have to basically uh, start a proprietary arm. So 
this is kind of talking about that. Uh, my guess is that watching the keynote would have made the mismatch between OpenAI's mission and the reality of its current focus impossible to ignore. I'm sure I wasn't the only one who cringed during it. I think the mismatch between mission and reality was impossible to fix. So again, this is a, a priorities of issue. Uh, overall, I expect that the OpenAI board's move to, will turn out to be a critical enabler of OpenAI's ability to deliver to deliver on its mission. So, you know, they they have this initial mission that they want to deliver on. How do we do that? Do we, uh, you know, say, well, we can't raise enough money, so we're going to start like promoting our organization and becoming proprietary, or do we want to uh, do it in other ways? In the future, aspirational people looking for power and profits will not be drawn to the company, and instead it will hire and retain true believers. Well, that's, you know, I don't know if that'll be true, but yeah. Um, <laughs> I think at this point, OpenAI kind of, yeah, <laughs> people have like a sort of a, a way of thinking about AI that's not, uh, doesn't align with, well, there's definitely a true believer aspect of it, but not, a, you know, I think there are a lot of people who think it's it's a, you know, a powerful thing. I guess it's, you know, I don't really know term out, but. After we finish going through the thread, there's a few things I would I would like to say about oh, yeah. that specifically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that's where I'm coming out on that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so then he said uh, he in a recent podcast he said OpenAI is not going to make it. That's what he called like this was yesterday. I think uh, I I'm going to take back my NGMI from the day before the Sama move. I feel much more positive about the company now. So that was uh, the open AI drama. So Jesse, you would like to say some things. I mean, I feel like it's the same stuff that I've, I say often, or often or something. but um, I don't know. Um, it's, oops, oh yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know if I want to play heavy handed on the sort of, um, I told you so angle it's not it's it's there but it feels a bit like a uh, low-hanging fruit um just a second i'll try to be on camera for this hold on Sorry. So, I mean, I guess what I'm saying, and, and I, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm thinking about this, like, what's actually a useful thing to say in this situation? Because I don't really know. I don't really know. I have, I have a lot of opinions about it from the sense of, like, there's an important kind of, is this going to move now? I think so. Hi. Um, oof. I don't know. <laughs> Um, it's a little strange to me. It looks like super. I had to zoom out of myself there, but I guess I guess it's just for me. Um, it, it it's it's quite interesting to me because I've been around on on the different sides of this, of of this discussion for a while. That I like, oh, like I feel great because Sam Altman is our CEO, and I trust X Y Z. And I trust the future because of this and that, and and there's sort of like the legions of of sort of I'll be a little bit I don't know disparaging with like the the, the acolytes of people who feel okay, open AI is is doing this. You have like the safety brands and like the, these legions of people that are trying to be like the safety people of long termists. You have you have people who are much more sober about stuff, and you have varying degrees of sort of like geopolitical tension like there's a there's a lot of tech people who work in tech and quote unquote ai that um you know have all all manner of the spectrum of like great ideals and then terrifying naivete as well and i think that's true for you know all the stuff that we do anybody in that space but but i think tech uh, open AI spaces, um, 
you know, this really interesting bubble where they're sort of like, depending like how much do you care about like all the critiques from like the Timmy Jabru DAIR crowd, like like there are people who do care about that, people who don't care about that, people who don't want to fuss with that. And I think I'm really curious to see where people fall out on the sense of is 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 the um, is is the aftermath basically going to be um, like <laughs> are people gonna is is the spinning basically going to be um, well, like I guess Jeremy said, um, I feel better now because now the true believers are going the right direction and I like the direction, right? And and I'm sure there's going to be people who are like, oh no, Sam Altman is my guy, and I don't know, I don't have faith in this now, I don't know what it's going to go in, and it's sort of, I don't know, um, I, I guess, I guess I'm left feeling like. Yes, I think I think the low hanging fruit to say about it is you know, money. It's going to change stuff, and now is it just being you know Microsoft, GPT, and uh, all that stuff? But it's it's a bit of it's a bit of like I will conclude by saying my the, one of the more alarming things about the whole experiment as it has been is that I think a lot of people, and I don't know if this is what Jeremy means by true believers or not, because I'm not really familiar with. The conversation and his take on it to, to that level, and uh, maybe you can say about like, um, there's a certain sense that I think people really thought. I think well-meaning, very, very well-meaning, very good intention people have put a lot into open AI as a sense that it is. I am accelerating the benevolent singularity. And we're not going to have to deal with a lot of that messy stuff because we've got open AI and we've got AGI happening. And it's sort of like, well, what do you what what now? Because you just you got GTP4 here and you gotta deal with the messiness of like I call it, but it's not really the best name for like sort of the geopolitical economic multinational pressure of these tools and and those kind of weren't really what is what is what is the what is the true believer who believes in open ai now say about that versus other forms of true believers and the different sects and the partisanship of what true believerism is now in that space i don't know um but it's just yeah i'll leave it at that you know. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, those are some good points, and I think the true believer aspect is uh, like, oh, we're done now. It'll be all better. <laughs> that's a little much, uh, given all the stuff that's going on in the world res uh, with respect to AI and AI ethics. And, and yeah, and and it's really tough because like part part like part of when I say there's a lot of project work being been done behind the scenes, like. Real talk. Some of it's about about exactly the same problem space as this. It's just a lot of my approach is I, I I'm kind of I want to start from the basis of like look we have some we have some weapons to fire at the targets of the big bad. Some of them maybe aren't even targets, but in those weapons, the silver bullets need to be considered with extreme sobriety <laughs> because they're not necessarily the silver bullets we want them to be and that's okay like that's okay i feel i feel like especially in the space of technology and future and futurism and long-termism and uh elements of rationalism and effective altruism and all these things that are kind of in this different space there's so much pressure and i almost feel uh, like um you know, whatever side of anthropic or not you're on, and 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 open AI, and and where you know where's all where's you know all we're gonna go next, and all those other things. It's sort of like, um, I don't know. Um, it's kind of like 
there's a lot of debris and fallout that maybe would be great to have some almost therapy session about, but at the same time, like, I think a lot of, I'm sure whatever, whatever the true believers are, there's a certain sect that was like absolutely sure, like, okay, as soon as OpenAI went, like, as soon as they made the push, like, as soon as there was the commitment, okay, we need to have a one of possibly a raise of a nonprofit. It's like, okay, then you know something's going to happen. And I guess, I guess the last circle back to the same point I made before in the past, too, is sort of there was a lot of faith put in. I would consider certain people, and yeah, yeah, the CEO is, is touring and stuff, but also like I felt a painful lack of like the part that I don't want to be is I told you so about this, that, but I think is important to say um, is a bit of like say this the right way. Um, I think there was a lot of true believer type energy that open AI would simply overcome or by like spiritually bypass, uh, but like technologically bypass, or I'm using a term like tech washing. Like it's just like our technology is so profound that we're ele we're just ele we're just bypassing, we are we are ascending beyond um the problems of like money and management and the ugly geopolitical mess that weighs down upon a lot of like technological stuff. I put on my like kind of I wear my like I don't know tinfoil hat and whatever right now and go like go full conspiracy. But like you know, um there's that pressure there even without that. And it's kind of like what do you do with that now? And and how much do you sort it out with? Um that's all. Yeah it's good. Kind of like the crypto space where you get a lot of firms that kind of just say, just believe in the, the mission and shut up and you'll be okay and, and we're okay. <laughs> a lot of them aren't okay because it's not enough to <laughs> have an organization that does something, you know. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, definitely, I think there is a lot of that where like there's this aspect of like don't doubt the mission. And, but in many organizations, that's true. And, you know, a healthy organization, you would have, like, you know, feedback. And that's why we have boards on 501c3s, because it's one way of accountab an accountability mechanism. So. And, and it's, it's just, in, in, a, in a sympathetic view, it's like, I feel for the people who really want, like, I'm dealing with, I'm, I'm, in, I'm not going to mention specific ones right now, because... Uh, you know, whatever, for various reasons, but like, I'm involved in organizations that are trying to really push ways of doing things forward differently. And I have a tremendous amount of sympathy for that. Orthogonal Labs, I think, is an example of that to some degree. Like, it's it's trying to do some things intentionally, and like that's really hard. I just feel like there's such a, a disparity between, like, AI hype and the news and the celebrity component of it that, that's there, which is so funny because the, 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 the AI is, is sort of like this, this thing that isn't really, it's not one person, it's, 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 this, it's this sort of disembodied thing, you know? But then we, we make it in these like convenient narratives about certain people and it's like, well, but I, I guess I'm just saying I have a lot of sympathy with trying to push things and do things differently. And like you've got to take risks. And I'm not I'm not prepared. I don't at all feel like, oh well, you know, Microsoft, they just they tanked it and, and everybody at, at what open AI failed and and all the like this. I don't think it's I don't think it's that simple, but it's also like you know it, it, we we're we're in this space right now where we have these tools that are released and, and we don't have their whole sub industries right now based off of chat gtp you know and, and just like what is that um we'll see it, there could be a lot that gets said around this but um 
we'll see where it goes and we'll see what what the fragments are i wonder i wonder i wonder as as a, as a fun sort of exercise for thought i wonder if people will i wonder if people will say this was a missed or like a very brief golden age of like open ai the open ai project or will it not be are we, are we at a turning point or not i really wonder what people will say about like this space because there's been this hype and the release and gtp3 3.54 and oh well, the news and then and then this burst of you know where's the trajectory go after all this stuff and it's oh go ahead i was just gonna say you know like um we haven't seen any new features and operating systems in a long time right and uh and you know, I, I I include Chrome in that or Android. Um, uh, like uh, again, the, the 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 attractive thing here is that um, the tech sees sees an actual new product um, that that does something and. Uh, you know, I I think we're seeing you know we're seeing the OS browser wars play out. Um, um, you know, but um, I, you know I love uh, you know Jeremy Howard's awesome and is much more connected to the the community of researchers than than um, than anybody I know. And um, you know I I look to the Francois Chalet and and Jeremy Howard for you know. Like for their takes on on the actual the state of the state of research, um, uh, and um, but I, I always always think about um, you, you know the 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 inertia of corporate governance, and it's um, you know it like like its needs to feed. Um, like this is this is just a um, this is an opportunity that none of them can avoid or none of them can ignore, and so it's like all all their eyes are on this this particular prize, you know, and controlling it. Not not necessarily open AI, but like 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 internally and and you know like in strategy. Um, it is it is a, a feature that actually works, um, and you know, like I said, like there's a lot of there's a, already an ecosystem built up around it, and and you know, and nobody really knows what it does yet, right. <laughs> or you know, like <laughs> like like all aspects of it aren't fully understood, you know. Um, uh, uh, so anyway, that's good. Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna I, bring. I think up, it's gonna be. Uh, yeah, I was gonna bring up the point. If you remember hype cycles, the Gartner hype cycles, you have the uh, peak of sort of hype, and then you have this this illusionment phase, and then a plateau of productivity. And it seems like you know, with large language models and some forms of generative AI, we're kind of like at we've kind of been at the peak, but then we've kind of gone right into a plateau of productivity in some ways. And also a, a trough of disillusionment in other ways. So like, you know, it's kind of uh, the Microsoft partnership is kind of like finding that plateau of productivity. And then people who are tr maybe true believers are now disillusioned by that. And it's kind of like both at the same time. And that's, it's kind of an interesting way to view that. I was going to say that the, the, the one thing I thought was really interesting was your, your, I don't know if that was like Twitter based analysis. Yeah, I don't um, know where that came from necessarily, but yeah. Oh, okay, okay. It, it, it reminded me somewhat of Computational Story Lab, you know, out of Vermont. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it, and the kind of the kind of work they do, uh, but it also, it, you know, just as a just as a research um, feature direction um, doing that kind of analysis to um, doing that kind of analysis to determine w what's going to happen. Um, so it's, it's going to be vague, but it's like, 
it's like how governments use like that kind of Twitter analysis to predict a, a revolution or something like that, or certainly like like mass demonstrations or um, something like like you know when you see that like increase in chatter yeah. and <laughs> and build up, um, it, it it can be it, you know like like. Certainly, it could be predictive of, of kind of mass social action, um, or or not. Like like that's that's actually a, an active um, active research area. And it was it was looking at that that um, was the first time I was introduced to hypergraphs, oh. and um, which is uh, which was really you know, related to the the math discussion, or at least I, I put a little thread in there about the the. Um, Wolfram Physics Project and uh, and a nice introduction to hypergraphs, um, which I, I thought I didn't know how much you cover in the graph neural net stuff. Um, yeah, discussions if if you've ever covered this. Yeah, we're actually working on some hypergraph stuff in Evil Worm. I haven't talked about it too much in the meetings, but that's something okay. that uh, I, I can we can talk about more. I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, I I'd be really interested. I'd be yeah. really interested. It's um, yeah, and I I didn't realize that um, yeah they they call their weekly meetings uh, Wolfram Physics Project meetings infra geometry. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Stephen Wolfram has been doing that uh, ever since the pandemic started. He's been doing like these live coding and, and other meetings and research. And well, yeah, I mean I, I love that. I love you know like to be a fly on the wall. For for someone who's doing work at a high level, is is like super interesting. Um, uh, but to also catch, you know, um, Gagard, Gagard, um, uh, and you know his his small group dis discussing the physics project is is really is really interesting too. Yeah, yeah. We'll check that out in the Slack. Uh, I can't remember what channel it's in, but um, yeah. So yeah, let's let's move on from this. This is a great discussion. Uh, we can probably talk about this more in the Slack. Um, I did have a couple more things though. So last week we talked, and of course, uh, Neurops twenty twenty three is coming up. Uh, we talked about the well, we talked about the tutorials. So this is a blog post. Uh, this is the uh, Neurops uh, blog. So they have uh, introducing the Neurops twenty twenty three tutorials. And this is, uh, so this kind of goes through the tutorials. So there will be 14 this year. Uh, again, I don't know what the uh, virtual versus in-person component of NURPS is going to be this year, but um, so, you know, these are the 14 tutorials that are happening this year. Um, you know, they, they have like a number of them that they try to, you know, they try to span a number of topics. So this includes human AI collaboration, diffusion models, automated theorem proving, which is uh, an emerging area that's pretty interesting. Um, uh, efficient deployment of large language models, AI governance for accountability, and others. So let's see, let's go through some of these. There is machine learning for theorem proving, uh, governance and accountability for machine learning, uh, application development using large language models. So this is more sort of driven by applications. Data-centric AI for re reliable and responsible AI. Um, you prefer learning with preferences. And I don't know exactly what that means, but, you know, probably how do you guide your learning. How to work with real humans and human AI systems. Language models meet real world models. World models are, of course, where the you know you you build a concept or a concept space, and then that's the world, and then the language model is fit into that. And that's very important for my kind of understanding how concepts are formed. Uh, exploring and exploiting data heterogeneity for prediction and decision making. Um, reconsidering overfitting. Uh, contributing to an efficient and democratized large model era. Um, data contribution estimation for machine learning. Oh, this one. What can we do about NeurIPS reviewer number two? <laughs> uh, 
challenges solutions, experiments, and open problems in peer review. So this has been a thing where, like, in peer review, like, people have always complained about, well, sometimes they call them reviewer number three, but, like, you always have, like, one reviewer who's kind of, like, on board with what you're doing and they have very little to say. And then, like, reviewer two or three is, like, really kind of, like, voluminous in their comments and, and have a lot of maybe they're against what you're doing but maybe also they have some good points so people always complain about that because it's kind of like oh this is a stumbling block for my work uh so you know it's <laughs> that people have tried to like kind of fix peer review and make it more sort of uh less contentious sometimes people just oh. kind of criticize work because they can criticize it and they don't necessarily provide any feedback. Sometimes they provide great feedback, but you know, it's it's uh it's like how do you build a peer review system that's completely virtuous or as close as we can get? We have some comments in the chat here. Okay, yeah. <laughs> These are just my stream of consciousness ones. <laughs> oh yeah, uh Melanie Mitchell's talk at SFI. Oh, yeah. what it was that? Yeah. I didn't know. Uh, she, it was um, it, it's kind of an a overview, you know. Um, I think it was one of their public science um, seminar series talks, um, and I, I didn't get to to watch it, but um, um, I thought I thought the comments were very interesting. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's like anytime someone goes over the history of of AGI, um, you're always going to get somebody who's commenting about, you know, Schmidt, Huber, uh, Lacoon, and, you know, like who deserves credits yeah. and when. <laughs> and then, and, and yeah, and yeah, then I just, yeah, we should, we should do a large language model and call it reviewer number six. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> That would be pretty good. Um, so yeah, then so those are the workshops. Then they're also or those are tutorials. Then there are the workshops. So the workshops are uh, you know we usually have uh, pretty good workshops. Uh, this year they have a number of different ones. Uh, one for generative AI for education. Another in machine learning and the physical sciences. Uh, AI for accelerated materials design. So that's kind of interesting. Associative memory and hope field networks in 2023. So this is something that, um, you know, you can actually, one of the ways in which we've developed the developmental brain bird vehicles is by using different hope field networks, uh, different, different variations on them. Uh, so that's interesting that, you know, kind of revisiting these models and, and developing, innovating them. This one's information theoretic principles and cognitive systems. So this is actually really interesting in light of what we're interested in as well. Um, causal representation learning, deep generative models for health, um, attributing model behavior at scale or attrib. Oh, AI meets moral philosophy and moral psychology. That's interesting. An interdisciplinary dialogue about computational ethics. Uh, heavy tales in machine learning, structure, stability, and dynamics. Uh, zero few shot learning, diffusion models, um, unifying representations in neural models, um, new frontiers in graph learning. Oh, by the way, if you're interested, um, the uh, Learning on Graphs conference is happening in, in the next few weeks. Uh, go to their website, Learning on Graphs, to register for that event. It should be interesting. That's a standalone uh, conference, but this is a workshop, New Frontiers in Graph Learning. Uh, agent Learning and Open-Endedness Workshop. Uh, generalization and Planning. Goal Condition Reinforcement Learning. Temporal graph learning workshop. So graph learning and graph neural networks has become a interesting topic. Uh, you know, this is kind of something we've been trying to get into with DevoWorm. And like I said, we've been working on that, but we've also been working on 
uh, hypergraphs, but we haven't I haven't really talked about it that much in the meetings. So maybe I'll, I'll bring that back up in in the next meeting. And we'll revisit. But, but I see Bronstein there. Which it's, one? The, it's, uh, the the one you were just on the temporal graphs. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that's a good sign. Oh, Michael Bronstein. Yeah, he's like the big name. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and then, you know, there's there's a lot of other, a lot of workshops, really. Uh, symbiosis of deep learning and differential equations, generative AI and biology. That's kind of interesting. Uh, I don't know of any of these people, but yeah, this is... These are all very interesting workshops. So this link is the, if you go to nerebs.cc, it's virtual 2023 events workshop. I don't know how much of each workshop is going to be made available, but sometimes they have their own website and they have like, you know, uh, some materials available. Sometimes it's pretty cryptic. I mean, it, like these, these more than anything should be recorded because nobody can attend all these. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like... <laughs> It's, it's, yeah. And there just seems to be more and more every year, you know, which makes right. it more and more impossible <laughs> that you can cover it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I don't know. Well, maybe we'll follow up on a couple of these and see what happens. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Where, where, um, where is it this year? Um, I'm not sure. Let's see. Is it Montreal? Maybe let's see. Uh, New Orleans, actually. Oh, New Orleans. Yeah. Okay. Huh. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, I mean, I, yeah. You know, I like gave up trying to to even get a spot a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, just because you know they would <laughs> like people would have bots ready to get them. <laughs> yeah, they'd be like sold and like you know. And it was it was cutting down the minutes of how quickly they'd sell out every yeah. year, you know. Um, well, anyways, um, um, yeah. So that's so, yeah. That's that's uh, Nurebs. We'll we'll follow up on that. That's happening in a few weeks. Um, we'll kind of revisit that as it comes as it comes to happen. Uh, I'd like to talk about, and I I know we this will be our paper for today or our papers. Um, there was a a uh, thing in nature it was a uh, nature physics actually. Uh, it's the fiftieth anniversary of renormalization group, and so this I, is. Uh, I, I put that in the chat. <laughs> yeah, awesome. yeah, yeah. This is great. Uh, so this is uh, renormalization group, which is a physics tool. Uh, now it started as this tool for kind of like you know quantum electrodynamics, but it's been applied to complexity theory. And so it's, it's of interest to our group. Um, so this this is a nice, but this is a nice historical overview of a topic and how it might be structured. You know, so if you're interested in this area, it might be interesting to kind of visit and see what you know have a window into that area of research. So yeah, the renormalization group. Um, this is the 50th anniversary of the work. Uh, there's an editorial always relevant. It's been around 50 years since Kenneth Wilson's work on the renormalization group. Nature Physics celebrates this anniversary of the collection of comments of its development and applications. Uh, yeah, apparently there were some Soviet influences on the work. Kenneth Wilson worked on the renormalization group during the Cold War when the communication between scientists and the Soviet Union in the West was restricted. So this is, you know, Soviet physics, of course, had some great work being done at the time, but it wasn't like something that uh, was diffused into the West maybe until after the Cold War. And so they, you know, there were a lot of things going on there. So this is some, one of those things that kind of made it through. And, um, you know, uh, so it originally was sort of a thing that was developed in quantum electrodynamics, which is a field of physics. It's a tool to eliminate divergences. So this is where you're renormalizing your data. Um, this actually can be the basis of understanding physics at different energy scales. Uh, and so this, this kind of goes through some of the different applications of this. Um, this is uh, talking, oh, go ahead. And it relates to, it relates to machine learning as well. 
or you know how how statistical mechanics or statistical physics um, can inform um, uh, machine learning and deep learning. Yeah. And so the Charles Charles Martin develops the Weight Watchers Python package. Um, we'll we'll talk a lot about um, you know it, like here's a trained particle physicist yeah. uh, and um, uh, but now does data science work and you know talks about how it's very relevant in, in data science. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I don't think they have any papers on on data science applications here, but um, so yeah, it, it's it's had a, a pretty strong influence on other areas of of quantitative research. Um, there's supersymmetric renormalization group flow, which is uh, important for quantum field theories. Uh, there's uh, quantum space time and matter from a renormalization group perspective, which is relative to quantum gravity, uh, which deals with uh, asymptotically safe models. Uh, and then, of course, quantum chromodynamics, which is uh, you know, this is uh, a renormalization group is a key ingredient in methods of improving perturbative computations in particle physics. So it's, it's, it plays a big role in these sort of computations. Where I briefly discuss its role in perturbative quantum chromodynamics, particularly the running of its coupling constant. Um, and then this paper, which we'll talk about the renormalization group for non equilibrium systems. So this is where most renormalization group studies have been performed on equilibrium systems. Here I give a personal reflection on the unexpected outcome of studying non-equilibrium flocking using renormalization methods. So they're going to talk about collective behaviors like flocking. Go ahead. Um, and then rigorous renormalization group. The renormalization group evolved from ad hoc procedures to cope with divergences and perturbative calculations. This comment summarizes efforts to develop a mathematically rigorous approach for renormalization group calculations. And so that's, and then this is one of the papers, of course, the renormalization group for non equilibrium systems. Um, uh, this talks about like the applications to uh, flocking and collective behaviors. Um, and so Ken Wilson's work, I'll just read the uh, some of the key points here. So, you know, historically, most renormalization group studies have been performed on equilibrium systems. Here I give a personal reflection on the unexpected outcome of studying non-equilibrium flocking using renormalization methods. So this was, of course, this group renormalization group theory was developed for the study of critical phenomena in equilibrium systems. So this is where we have these sudden changes or these parameters that reach a certain value and then you get sudden changes in the behavior of the things. And so this is, uh, this kind of gives a reference there. Renormalization group methods had an immediate and lasting impact. It, but however, in his Nobel lecture delivered in late 1982, Ken Wilson remarked, in my view, the extensive research that has already been carried out using the renormalization group uh, is only the beginning of the study of a much larger range of applications that will be discovered over the next 20 years, or the next, perhaps the next century, depending. In this comment, I will describe my own experience developing one such application, the study of non-equilibrium stochastic dynamical systems. So these are stochastic dynamical systems or characterized by SDEs or stochastic dynamical equations. And so, you know, they, they have a specific structure that's a little bit different than your average ODE or PDE or, you know, that basically they can uh, include stochastic terms that characterize sort of stochastic behaviors or, you know, generating random behaviors or, you know, things like that. And so, uh, the initial developments of the renormalization group theory by Leo Kadanoff and Ken Wilson were based on equilibrium systems. And we talked about this in terms of like different uh, aspects of uh, entropy, where, you know, in, when we talk about entropy, we're usually talking about a closed system or an equilibrium system. 
and most life, say, is uh, non-equal or open. And so, you know, it's important to think about these kind of, you know, non-equilibrium or open systems as sort of the rule rather than the exception. But in analytics, we usually use the closed case or the equilibrium system because it's easier to solve. And it does give us good results, but it's, you know, it is at equilibrium. In these cases, it is possible to write a Hamiltonian that governs the statistical properties of the system. So you can characterize, in, in the equilibrium case, you can characterize this with a Hamiltonian, which is a, uh, an equation that will model the state of the system. The basic idea is to consider many body systems at a coarse grain level, averaging the microscopic degrees of freedom over a larger length scale. So this is where you have, like in a, in a flock, you have individual birds, and this is a many body system that has a lot of interactions. And so you want to be able to uh, model the entire flock instead of the individual birds in the flock in their behaviors. So you want to be able to average out the microscopic degrees of freedom over a larger length scale. Um, Kadanoff proposed that a coarse grain system can, after appropriate rescaling, be described by a Hamiltonian of the same form as the initial model, but with a set of renormalized parameters. So basically, you have to rescale and renormalize everything to get a, an appropriate description. And you can fit this into a Hamiltonian at equilibrium. The transformation of parameters at a finer scale into those at a coarser scale constitutes the renormalization group. So you're going to take the parameters from a finer scale like the individual and renormalize it to something that's a group or a collective parameter. Repeatedly applying this coarsening process produces a so-called flow of the parameters. So this is where you have, you know, you can move from scale to scale. This flow features fixed points or special values that do not change on the renormalization. These parameters correspond to the critical point where the system obeys universal scaling laws. System with, systems with the same scaling laws are said to belong to the same universality class. So we've talked about like universality when we talked about physical computation. And we talked about how you know we, we make the assumption a lot of times, say in complexity theory, about like how you have uh, different types of systems, sometimes they're wildly different types of systems, like bird flocks and uh, particle dynamics and, uh, you know, maybe like embryogenesis and, you know, social groups, human social groups and social insects. All these different types of uh, systems have sort of the same properties, or you can use the same mathematical tools to describe uh, their dynamics and these critical points where they change their state. And so when you have collective behavioral changes in state, that's considered a critical, uh, you know, critical event where you have a bunch of individuals doing things that, you know, result in some sort of, uh, you, know, ma you know, mass change in, in the group. So we, we've talked about the uh, sand pile model, which is where you drop grains of sand onto a pile. The, the pile accumulates and eventually it's displaced with avalanches of certain sizes. So a certain number of grains are displaced from the top and go downward uh, as it reaches a critical point. And so we have these critical points that we can describe. We have the process by which we can describe how they happen, but we cannot describe like why you get a, say, a displacement of a certain size or when those displacements occur in time. Those are the stochastic aspects of that system. And so we can maybe describe it with a stochastic differential equation, but you know, we don't we can't say necessarily that we can predict that. So this is where this all comes into play. Normalization is basically taking the properties of the individuals and making it into a larger, um, you know, describing the larger structure. As, as, as sort of coarsening those parameters. So, uh, yeah, so we talked about this, about universality classes. Another key idea in renormalization group theory is the existence of an upper critical dimension, B sub C. Above this dimension, the fixed point corresponding to mean field theory is stable, which means it's correctly capturing the critical behavior. 
So we have this fixed point, and then there's a stability point, which is capturing the critical behavior. So basically, we should be able to describe the critical points at which the system will change. For lower dimensions, an approximation of the critical behavior can be found by solving the renormalization group equations perturb, uh, perturbatively in orders uh, in certain order to obscale, obtain the scaling components in leading orders. Uh, subsequent work quickly extended the use of renormalization groups to study the dynamics of critical phenomena, and so that's this reference six, which is uh, uh, 1977. There are some other references four and five. These are phys revlet and uh, uh, phys b condensed matter. So these are old classic papers from the 70s. Um, although initially developed in equilibrium systems, it was clear that dynamic renormalization groups could be used to study stochastic dynamics in non-equilibrium systems. So in non-equilibrium systems, we don't we don't assume that they're operating in equilibrium. They do not have a Hamiltonian that can describe them. And Hamiltonian is important because it allows us to describe things as this in the statistical physics mode, where we can describe, say, a bunch of particles that where they're they sort of undergo this energy minimization down to like uh, energy minima, and so you know we, when we have a bunch of particles uh, that all kind of have the same energy, uh, eventually we want to observe those particles kind of settle into their uh, stable states or their, you know, they undergo entropy and they end up in uh, low energy states. So we can describe that whole process using Hamiltonian, but that assumes equilibrium. In non-equilibrium systems, it's a little bit different. And so this is something that, you know, they're, they're talking here about using stochastic dynamics in non-equilibrium systems. So this is a very exciting perspective for renormalization groups. As most systems in nature are driven out of equilibrium by external forces. So, you know, we have things that happen to systems that drive them out of equilibrium. And this is something that, again, the real world demands that we do in our modeling. And yet they exhibit robust scaling behavior similar to those observed in equilibrium critical phenomena. So what's interesting is we can observe these kind of out of or non-equilibrium systems. They're driven out of equilibrium by various means. You can't necessarily use a statistical physics methodology to dis fully describe them, and yet they exhibit the same types of scaling behaviors we see in the Hamiltonian case, in the case where we have equilibrium critical phenomena. One such example is the carter parisi zhang model, or the uh, KPZ equation, which has been proposed to describe the inter uh, described interface growth. And so this is from 1986. Interface growth is uh, where we have uh, well, we have bird uh, we have bird flocks, fish schools, we have bird flocks here, fish schools, and then we have bacterial swarms, and so this is what they refer to larger class of problems, um, uh, interface growth. Uh, in the case of the KPZ equation, the renormalization group has been successfully used to understand its scaling behaviors. On a personal level, studying the KPZ equation and its variance gave me the opportunity to learn and appreciate these powerful techniques. Uh, later, we worked with John Toner to develop a hydrodynamic theory of flocking. So this is where you describe this as a flow of water or, or activity in a, in a medium, it, you know, with air being sort of like a variation on liquid. So you have hydrodynamics, but you kind of have aerodynamics. Those, those kind of equations are linked, so you can actually develop the hydrodynamic theory of flocking, and you know use those hook in hydrodynamic equations to describe these, and then of course use renormalization methods in, in the process. So the most recognizable examples of flocking occur in bird flocks and fish schools. However, this type of collective motion can also arise at similar length scales, for example, in bacterial swarms or mixtures of motor proteins and microtubules. So you have things at various size scales, but also in different kinds of systems where the causal mechanisms or the, uh, you know, the materials are different, but they have the same set of behaviors. Uh, and so this is kind of going through his personal reflections more. Um, and, you know, so this is, uh, 
good stuff. And I'll end with this part here. Um, you know, talking about the flocking model. Uh, the, so dynamic, the most recently dynamics renormalization group approach has been used to study flocking behaviors in the presence of quench disorder and in natural swarms. So natural swarms is this reference 19. This is from Nature Physics very recently. And quench disorder is this article uh, in the Journal of Physics Review Letters 2022. Uh, so there are different domains that you can apply this to. The flocking model has also become influential in areas outside physics, ranging from robotics to traffic. And so, you know, looking at social robotics or looking at traffic patterns. Dirk Kelbing wrote a paper on this. Uh, on, uh, let's see, in in 2001. So this has been around for a while. Beyond flocking, the versatility and power of the renormalization group-based approach has been demonstrated in different non-equilibrium systems, such as active matter and living systems. So active matter being like these systems that we talk about in Dworm, actually, where you have different types of like collective behavior and materials uh, where it's not, you know, the, the, the active matter actually undergoes different sorts of shape changes and, and uh, uh, their flexible uh, materials and things like that. Uh, and of course, living systems where you have, uh, you know, collectives of, of cells or something like that. For example, it has been used to develop a coarse graining approach for studying neural activities in a large network of neurons. It reveals a quasi-universal scaling behavior and neuron firing patterns in different parts of the brain. And that's reference 23, and that's actually from PNAS uh, in 2023. I don't know what that work is, but, um, you know, it's something we will follow up on. In our own recent work, my colleagues and I constructed a state space approach to understand the inverse power law scaling of the energy dissipation rate across different scales and non-equilibrium reaction networks. So this is work on uh, metabolics uh, from 2021 and 2022. Non-equilibrium biological systems often exhibit unexpected behaviors that are drastically different from their equilibrium counterparts. I think that's an important parting message is that non-equilibrium systems are not at all like equilibrium systems, and we need to expect that their behaviors are drastically different. Nevertheless, like equilibrium statistical physics models, that ex they exhibit collective behaviors across different scales. So we do have these sort of similarities in how they behave at the aggregate, but they are they do produce a lot of different types of states. Um, I believe that bringing fundamental ideas of coarse graining and the renormalization group into the study of active and living systems is one of the most promising research directions that you can make. And so this is a good um, overview. You know, you may not understand all of it. I didn't. But, you know, you have to kind of wet that wash over you and take the lessons you can from it. Yeah, really, really a super important tool um, that has that has changed, uh, like, uh, changed physics. Uh, and, it, like, Charles Martin, so I put a link to Weight Watchers, the, the Python package there. Um, so I believe he was a student of Leo Kadanoff's. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And... Um, uh, but I was also going to say that in the um, uh, event, uh, events discussion channel, um, just a bit ago, November 8th, I put a link to the Active Matter and Beyond conference um, that uh, all the talks are online. Uh, if you want to get lost in physics talk that is uh, uh, above my head, um, there they were a great number of um, really interesting uh, it, like you know it's interesting because it's so widely applicable and and there's so many really interesting uh, like example cases that um, that you can learn about from from the different talks even if the math is a bit beyond me yeah <laughs> but really good stuff and and yeah like uh, Weight Watchers the package talks about how to how to again apply some of these ideas to um, better understanding of deep learning and and, uh, and training, uh, yeah. like I issues that come up in in training neural nets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that should be 
and interesting. I, I've, I've really enjoyed seeing like a lot of the work in uh, applied physics and other areas come into machine learning. <laughs> uh, Amanda said, RE Sandpile model. I'm working on a project for work that involves explosive synchronization in the brain. That's great. Yeah, that's definitely there's been a fair amount of work on that. And that, that I'm interested in hearing more about that at some point. You're, you're going to share that PDF, yeah? Yes. I, I don't have I don't have access to it. So. I, I want to share um, some papers that are relevant to what I'm working on. Mm -hmm. um, I will share them in the Slack. All right. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. But, but Bradley, if, if you've got uh, any of those um, 50 years of uh, nature papers you want to share too, uh, that'd be great. Oh, yeah. I do that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for attending the meeting this week. Uh, looks like Jesse had to leave, but that's fine. Um, so, yeah, thanks for attending and talk to you next week. Yeah, talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Take care. Take care. Bye.